Please welcome to the virtual stage Dr. Friederike Otto, Senior Lecturer of Climate Science at Imperial College of London, in conversation with Bloomberg Green's Eric Roston. Hi, everyone. Thank you for uh, attending what poses to be a fascinating conversation with a fascinating person. Dr. Frederica Otto is Senior Lecturer at uh, Imperial College London, and for the last several years, she has led a team that has uh, time and time again answered the fundamental question that a lot of people have about climate change, uh, or really about the weather, which is, is climate change behind it? Um, so, Dr. Otto, thank you so much for joining us. Um, just for starters, uh, why don't you share with us a little bit about, um, I don't know, uh, how do you how did you get into this to begin with? Uh, you know, it, people were asking for years, uh, was climate change involved in this or that weather event before your team came along and said, yes, 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 maybe, and probably yes. Yeah, um, thank you very much um, for, for having me. Um, how, I think the main reason why I got into this is precisely because people are constantly asking the question, when an extreme event happened, what's the role of climate change? And for a long time, the reaction of scientists to that question was a bit unsatisfactory. It was either um, we saying, well, we can't attribute individual weather events, but it might be the kind of, it's, it's the kind of event we expect to see more of. Or um, people would say, well, we're living in a world where climate change is happening. So obviously that affects the weather. And the latter is trivially true, but it doesn't tell you much. It doesn't uh, contain much information because it doesn't really answer the question how and, and to what extent climate change affects the weather. And um, so therefore we, we started um, um, to try and answer that question um, so that there was not just people with uh, an agenda, a political agenda answering the question, but also scientific evidence to put into the discussion. What are some of the most uh, startling uh, findings that you have um, uh, uncovered in the, the six years that World Weather Attribution has been uh, has been live? That's a difficult question because there are some some events um, and one that probably is still in the memory of many people is uh, the heat wave in Canada and the western north uh, northern US this summer. Um, that was an event that would have been basically impossible to occur without climate change. And uh, we looked at the heat wave in Siberia last year. That was also an event that where climate change was a complete game changer and only made the event possible. But um, I think there are also um, there are other events where climate change did play a smaller role or where or where it even just didn't really play a role at all that were, uh, I think, really important studies for us to do. So one is um, on a drought in Sao Paulo that happened in 2014, where we found that climate change did actually not alter the likelihood of that event to occur. But because of um, an almost exponential increase in the water usage in the area, the impacts of that drought were dramatically more, um, yeah, were dramatically worse than they would have they would have been 10 years earlier. And so um, that I think it's really just how big a role the vulnerability and whether or not people are informed or if there's early warning about the events, how much of a role that plays in turning a weather event into a disaster is something that um, is often more shocking to me actually than the climate change signal. I wanna, um... <clears throat> I, I want to take a second and uh, so last month, uh, uh, Dr. Otto worked with us at Bloomberg Green on a, on a profile of, of her and her team's work. Um, and I, I want to give a sense um, and, and transition here a second. Like this, this is a very small group of people that you have organized. 
you have gone from uh, a project uh, uh, as an arm of a nonprofit in 2015 to um, uh, basically a global media phenomenon. The, um, the, the heat wave you mentioned in June, I think got something on the order of 3,500 uh, articles uh, written about it, newspaper articles around the world. Um, and, uh, and you and your, your co-founder, uh, Hirjan uh, von Oldenburg were made uh, Time Magazine's uh, two of the most hundred, two of the hundred most influential people in the world um, in, in uh, uh, September. I, I want people to understand that background uh, to understand the next uh, thing I wanna say. Um, so I worked with Freddie, I, I worked with Hirdjian, Hirdjian, excuse me, um, who, uh, who suffered through the rise of this organization from cancer for eight years uh, and struggled until his end in October uh, when he passed away of this disease. Um, and I want to spend a few minutes just hearing you speak about him, uh, interviewing him, interviewing you, interviewing your colleagues about him was an extremely moving and memorable experience. And I'd like everyone in the audience to know who he was and what he did to um, help you achieve this, this work you've been doing. Yeah, um, thank you. Thanks for, for giving me the opportunity to talk about Ghet Yan because um, we were we were colleagues, so we started um, to do world weather attribution together. But when we started it, I was I was a postdoc who had written uh, and, and published one uh, academic paper, uh, so I didn't have a track record of actually um, be, being able to pull pull something off in in the academic world. And still, he. Um, he treated me uh, and we we have been partner yeah like a partner from the start we have been partners from the very start despite him having 20 years more experience lots of uh, academic uh, credit in in climate science and we had a very um comparable uh, yeah different skill sets but really the same goals we both wanted to answer the question that people actually ask of scientists. So try to make science as useful as, as, as we possibly can and answer the question that we can answer, but crucially not more. And, and that was something that Ghet Jan has always aimed at doing. And also um, he didn't, yeah, he didn't only um, wanted to get the science right, but really do the right thing. And before we started to work together on world weather attribution, he had developed a platform that's called Climate Explorer that allows everyone in the world, even with the most crappy internet connection, to access um, all, all observational data from weather stations in the world that, that are shared publicly and all climate model data that is available so that science is less um of a yeah a less exclusive endeavor and that really is is inclusive of people around the world people who um might have not training and programming and and so on and that um and that also allowed us to include in all our weather at home studies always people uh from the area of the events um that occurred and that was um and that was, I think, one of the main reasons why it was successful, because we didn't try and answer the question that might be scientifically most attractive, but by working with the Red Cross, by always working with people in the area, we tried to understand what about, what is it about this weather event that actually are people vulnerable to, and then identify the role of, of climate change in that event. And yeah, and Gert Jan was absolutely passionate uh, about this this work. He worked on it until until days before his death in in October. Um, we yeah, uh, the study. We I will have to finish the study, but I, I will. And um, he, um, without him, this would not have been possible, because he um, he had the tools, he had the statistical skills. And that um, put together with my skill set, with it, which is more in interpreting the data, putting it into words, really made us able to answer the questions, to go to the edge of the science, but not beyond, and and answer it in a way that um, that people can understand. 
Yeah, I do. I, I really hope uh, uh, people are hearing and uh, will remember your comments, remember Khir Dian, because uh, the limited time I knew him, um, it, it's just, you know, science, it comes out over headlines. Uh, it's discussed by politicians, it's discussed in business, it's discussed everywhere. Um, but there are people, um, in Khir Dian's case, just really extraordinary, warm, giving, um, but wholly unsentimental um, science-minded people who uh, are behind this and providing answers to uh, questions that people have. Now, one thing that was very important to him, I know, is, um, and you mentioned uh, his, his weather database, was he had a real interest in democratizing data and making climate analysis of whether something that anyone can do on any internet connection anywhere in the world. Um, and so tell us a little bit about the democratization of this work. Um, who will be able to, uh, in the near term, um, do this kind of work on extreme weather events? Um, and then what's next for world weather attribution as this skill set becomes more broadly accessible? So in theory, really everyone can do these kind of studies because um, what we don't do in world weather attribution is um, to wait for our studies to be peer reviewed before we publish them because we want um, the scientific evidence to be available when uh, the public and the media are discussing the role of climate change in the event, which is uh, on timescales that the peer review process can cannot possibly um, manage in, in in academia, but to but of course peer review is is crucially important for the the quality of the science and it's the fundamental basis of the scientific methodology, and so not to uh, yeah not to publish rubbish basically we had to try and mimic um, the the peer review process in 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 a way um, that allows us to do these studies quickly and so. What we do is every time we do a study, we write a scientific paper, which is a relatively boring read, but it lays out in, in all detail what are our assumptions, which data do we use, why do we use it, and on the Climate Explorer, so on this platform that Khed Jan built, all the data is available, and all the, the, the routines, the statistical methods that we use are available there to use, so everyone can go and check did we actually make a mistake? What, what did we do? And of course, um, so in theory, everyone can do this. The problem and the bottleneck with world weather attribution is always that it's very hard to do this if you have never done it before. And if you don't have the expertise and, uh, in, in, in climate science or, or, or in statistics or, or in some natural background and have actually um, looked at extreme weather events because what you do in attribution is bringing together observations and often very messy data on on the ground on small locations with large-scale climate models um, and, and both types of data are are very different and need to be analyzed in very different ways but then still need to answer the same question and that's non-trivial and that takes some expertise and so that is what what has always been the bottleneck for world weather attribution because we don't it's an initiative that we are doing because we find it important um, but it's not one where we have funding or we have where we have a large um, team of of postdocs who can who can help uh, with the work and so we always work with people who volunteer their time and there is just a limited number of people around the world who have the skill set and are able to drop everything and work with us for, for a week on, uh, on the study. So one goal for world weather attribution going forward is to put it on a bit more sustainable feed um, so that we are able to do, to do studies uh, slightly less ad hoc and particularly uh, more in the global south because it's still always a lot easier to find people with a heat wave in Canada, for example, uh, immediately a, a group of Canadian scientists said, yes, we really want to know the answers. Here we are and we work with you. Um, whereas in um, most people, most scientists employed in the global south 
don't have the mandate to do research. They have a mandate to, to teach and to provide weather forecasts or other services and just don't have the capacity to drop everything. And so that is something which um, World Weather Attribution will need to be able to fund in order to, to fill this, these big gaps mm -hmm. in the global south in our understanding of how climate change affects weather. Uh, just in the last minute or two we have here, uh, since we're gathered either actually or virtually at uh, COP26 in Glasgow, what uh, specifically for the, uh, the diplomats engaged in the negotiations and the, uh, the many uh, groups and, and uh, interests sort of swarming around them, what's the message from World Weather Attribution to uh, people whose job it is this week to get their arms around uh, emissions and, you know, turn them off eventually. Well, I think a big message from World Weather Attribution is that the era of loss and damage has long begun. So climate change is not something happening somewhere else in the future, but is, is killing people um, for or already now on, on a large scale. And, and that is at 1.2 degree warming. So uh, we don't really want actually to imagine how that would be at, in a three degree world or even in a 2.5 degree world, which is sort of around where current pledges are, because for, for many, for the most vulnerable in our society, it's already um, unsustainable. And so um, that means there's absolutely um, no doubt that not uh, that that not burning fossil fuels is incredibly more cheaper than continue to burn fossil fuels but also we need to address adaptation and loss and damage that is happening already it's not just a problem of the future wise words uh thank you so much dr otto for for joining us uh, anyone interested uh in following up uh and i i expect everyone will be um, World Weather Attribution can be found at worldweatherattribution.org. Uh, there is a, uh, all of the uh, studies they've done are there in an accessible uh, for the public format. And at Bloomberg Green, uh, you can read our recent profile of Dr. Otto. Uh, and just today, we published uh, an overview of how they did their uh, June heat wave study in the, the U.S. and uh, Canada. So um, thank you again, and uh, everyone in, uh, enjoy your time at COP if that's the right sign off here. Uh, thank you very much.